Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. In our last video, we discussed early redshift measurements in white dwarfs and difficulties in measuring their temperatures, particularly for Sirius B. Today we present modern measurements of redshifts and we'll discuss the failure of astrophysicists to obtain consistent temperatures for their stars using their models. Let us begin by discussing X-rays, which Sirius B powerfully emits as seen in this image. Early on, X-ray emissions from Sirius B were claimed to arise from a miniature corona around the star. The authors claim that the data fit nicely by assuming a certain coronal pressure and temperature of about 2 million Kelvin. However, Martin et al. would analyze soft X-rays and advance a photospheric origin instead with a proposed temperature of about 28,000 Kelvin. A few years later, Perel et al. would analyze the soft X-ray spectrum in the range of 50 to 200 angstroms and obtain a dramatically different temperature of 25,000 to 26,000 Kelvin using a theoretical model for flux in the white dwarf. They would also calculate both a log of the surface gravity little g, log of g equals 8.5 to 8.7, where g is in meters per second squared, and a radius r equals 0 0.0079 to 0 0.0085 of the radius of the sun from the calculated flux and measured parallax for the star. As we saw previously, the radius is derived from this equation, where F sub V is the monochromatic flux for the star, R is the radius, D is the parallax, and H sub V is the monochromatic Eddington flux calculated from the white dwarf model. To start, Eddington's estimation of stellar fluxes violates thermodynamics and ignores the possibility that stars are not ideal gases, as we saw in this video. Eddington flux is derived from models which have several variables, including effective temperature, composition of the atmosphere, hydrogen layer or H layer, thickness above the surface, and, of course, the assumption that emissivity is equal to 1. The composition of a WA white dwarf atmosphere is usually assumed to be essentially pure hydrogen. We will discuss why that is in question in our next videos. The H layer is perhaps the most unreasonable variable, with H layers that differ by six orders of magnitude, as can be seen in this paper. Even worse, Perel et al. claim to have even an extra parameter, the column density N sub H of X-ray absorbing neutral gas between the star and the Earth. Yet they have no way of measuring the column density of absorbing neutral gas. That parameter allows them to essentially mimic a lower emissivity for the star. Between the flux, the radius, hydrogen layer thickness, the composition, and the unreasonableness of claiming to account for the total amount of gas between the star and the Earth, and even more, astronomers have invented non-falsifiable models where almost none of the variables involved can be measured or categorically proven to be wrong. Yet non-falsable science isn't science at all. It's just a belief system that they have built for themselves. Leaving behind x-rays and moving to the UV, we turn to this paper published by Holberg et al. in 1998. They examined the UV spectrum of Sirius B as presented in this figure. They report a new well-defined effective temperature of 24,790 plus or minus 100 Kelvin and a surface gravity of log of G equals 8.57 plus or minus 0 0.06 for Sirius B. Using a parallax from Hipparchus and a previously published redshift, they compute a mass of 0 0.984 plus or minus 0 0.074 of the mass of the Sun and a radius R of 0 0.0084 plus or minus 0 0.00025 of the radius of the Sun. They actually compute these values using the Gernstein et al. gravitational redshift obtained in 1971, which we discussed in our last presentation. Of course, problems with redshifts reported by Greenstein et al. were significant as one recalls that the redshifts obtained were dependent on the lines used for analysis. In any event, note what is happening in this case with temperature. To use their own words, 
we now have a well-defined value of 24,790 plus or minus 100 Kelvin. This is completely outside the range of the two previous determinations of 28,000 Kelvin by Martin et al. and 25,000 to 26,000 Kelvin by Perel et al. Now we move to the analysis of the optical spectrum of Sirius B obtained using the Hubble satellite, especially the hydrogen Balmer lines reported in these two papers. Hubble has two separate gratings on its spectrograph instrument used to obtain a final spectrum, one from 3,000 to 5,700 angstroms and another from 6,300 to 6,900 angstroms. The authors write, as the hydrogen alpha line profile seen on the figure on the right, shows a slight roll-off in the flux toward short wavelengths, which we attribute to some light loss in the slit. We did not include it in the determination of temperature and gravity. Using white dwarf models, and because of the roll-off used to discount the hydrogen alpha line, the authors fit this spectrum to synthetic spectra to obtain an effective temperature and a log of surface gravity of 25,000 193 plus or minus 37 Kelvin and 8.556 plus or minus 0.01 respectively. Again, this differs from the 24,790 plus or minus 100 Kelvin just obtained by Holberg et al. in 1998. Next, Barstow et al. addressed the hydrogen alpha line. In their first paper, they extract a gravitational redshift of 77.4 plus or minus 0.8 kilometers per second, but this number is changed to 80.42 plus or minus 4.43 in the second paper. Note how the error bar in the second paper is now drastically increased. They do not report red shifts for any of the other hydrogen lines, even though they could have used error bars to account for the lower resolution of the two Hubble gratings. The obvious question remains, what are the red shifts of the other hydrogen lines and why did the journal not ask for their publication in light of the known variations in red shifts in earlier papers? The authors claim that a standard analysis of the individual lines yields similar results but with larger uncertainties. It seems that when including all of the data, it made their conclusions less clear and as a result, they simply threw away the majority of it. However, what is most surprising is their admission that stark shifts may be present. In the laboratory, these are red shifts caused by local electric fields. They freely admit that they have not routinely considered the possible stark shifts of the lines. They argue that stark shifts are highly dependent on plasma density and perform calculations assuring themselves that their contributions would be tiny. Of course, if interaction between atoms takes place in the white dwarf, which is an obvious supposition on its face, then all red shifts of hydrogen Balmer lines do not need gravity to be explained. We will go into that more in the next video. Interestingly, it also becomes clear in this paper that spectroscopic methods of mass determination are not in agreement with red shift methods. Although different determinations of M are not significantly different outside the assigned one sigma uncertainty ranges, it is a concern that we do not obtain better agreement between various methods of determining M. They had obtained a mass of 0.978 mass of the Sun from their models and 1.02 mass of the Sun from the gravitational redshift measurements. However, remember that all these measurements are based on the same observation, the behavior of the Balmer lines in Sirius B. One method examines the width of the line, the other examines the red shift, but both are fundamentally related. It is no wonder that there is at least some agreement. The gravitational red shift of Sirius B would be measured again using Hubble by Barstow et al. in 2013. The work was reported at a conference in 2017. The results were described in this manner. Unfortunately, the data confirmed that there was a definite discrepancy between the gravitational and dynamic mass of about 10%, which was larger than the measurement uncertainty. This may be the closest any astrophysicist has come to understanding that their fictions do not match up with the facts. 
However, instead of reconciling with reality, in 2018, Joyce et al. measured the gravitational redshift of Sirius B anu using Hubble. In this paper, they monitor the redshift using the core of the hydrogen alpha line. They completely dismiss the presence of the broad wings or the spread out edges on each side of the central line, continuing the theme of ignoring uncomfortable data. The presence of broad wings could be a sign of chemical coordination and the possibility that stark redshifts do exist as discussed above. In any case, in Joyce et al., they once again use the other Balmer lines to obtain temperature and surface gravity from their models while ignoring the associated redshifts from these lines. This time, they obtain a gravitational redshift of 80.65 plus or minus 0.77 kilometers per second from hydrogen alpha, which is outside the error bar of the 77.4 plus or minus 0.8 kilometers per second result obtained by Barstow et al. in 2005 using Hubble data. There are two other important aspects of the paper by Joyce et al. In the introduction, when discussing possible errors in gravitational redshift measurements, they note some of this overestimate may have been due to the contribution of the start pressure shift, which can produce an additional shift in WD absorption lines. Laboratory-based studies simulating WD plasma environments have demonstrated that this effect could account for up to 50% of the measured redshift, depending on the lines used and the amount of broad line wings included when measuring the wavelength. Clearly, it is impossible to truly mimic the surface of a white dwarf in the laboratory. In fact, stark effects could account for the entire redshift measured and deal a fatal blow to the gravity explanation for red shifts in their models. Everything we have discussed until now can be distilled into this table with a focus on temperature, surface gravity, redshift, and error bars. Look at the measurements from 2005 and the error bars for the effective temperature. 25,193 Kelvin and an error bar of only 37 Kelvin. By the time we reach Joyce et al.'s paper in 2018, the temperature has now increased outside this range to 25,922 Kelvin, but now the error bar is completely missing. Why is that? If you want to understand why, this figure, taken from Joyce et al., plots the radius of Sirius B against mass. The mass determined from dynamic methods is represented by the dark blue square. This point is taken from 2017 research using Kepler's third law of motion to determine the mass of the two orbiting stars. This was accomplished using nearly two decades of Hubble measurements in combination with nearly 2300 historical measurements dating back to the 19th century. A mass of 1.018 plus or minus 0.011 of the mass of the Sun was thereby determined for Sirius B and there can be little doubt about the validity of that number. The green diamond and red diamonds on the left are the mass determined from the gravitational redshifts using two different positions on the Hubble telescope gratings. The dashed lines and the solid lines correspond to different models of thin and thick hydrogen layers respectively. The red line corresponds to a temperature of 25,922 Kelvin. This temperature is obtained from models which have been used to fit the data obtained from the higher Balmer lines. The solid line on the left is a temperature line of 10,000 Kelvin from white dwarf models, whereas the one on the right is the 40,000 Kelvin line. Note that the green error bars for the green diamond extend beyond both the 10,000 Kelvin solid line on the left and well beyond the 40,000 Kelvin solid line on the right for thick hydrogen models. So now the temperature of the white dwarf has become essentially undefined for that point. For the red diamond, the error bar extends well below 25,922 Kelvin on the left and very much above 40,000 on the right. This essentially means that an effort to arrive at an effective temperature from white dwarf models has been abandoned. As a result, it is not surprising that the Joyce et al. paper does not even mention any estimates of surface gravity whatsoever, nor of those error bars. The authors have essentially abandoned the models which link temperature, surface gravity, and atmospheric composition in the white dwarf. Everything now hinges on determining mass and radius 
using gravitational redshifts. Well, that is all for today. Since the results from models should be discounted, we are left with gravitational redshifts as the only proof that white dwarfs are extremely dense. We will return to the white dwarf in the next presentation. At that time, problems with gravitational redshift measurements will be further explored, revealing that white dwarfs are simply not extremely dense. Both Eddington and Chandrasekhar were in error. White dwarfs simply have ordinary densities and an altered photospheric lattice. That is why their luminosity is low. In reality, the electron degeneracy occurs not in an ultra-dense white dwarf, but in all stars when delocalized electrons enter conduction bands in a one-component plasma. That is why the Sun and the main sequence of the stars cannot undergo gravitational collapse. The prevention of stellar collapse has nothing to do with the cessation of radiation or gas pressure as proposed by Eddington. It is all about the presence of degeneracy and that spells the end of black holes. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on the next video.